begin today's recording by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we are on. I am on Burrawang land. Where are you, Breeza? I am on the land of the Jajarurung people. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who are tuning in today. And wherever you're listening to the potty today, make sure you know whose land you're on. Join us each week for some booze-free banter about life without booze. If you're entertaining cutting back your booze by a day, a week, a month, or for the rest of your life, we would love for you to tune in. Buckle up and come along for a ride that may just change your life. If any of today's conversations have been triggering, please reach out to your local support centre in Australia. That is Lifeline 131114. Let's crack again. Let's crack again, Mason. <laughs> what you got? What you got? You cup there, Brisa. Well, I actually have just called myself um, a Altina Levy in a rosé. Rosé. Into a nice little fancy glass. Fancy. And I'm loving it sick. Loving it sick. <laughs> Alcohol free wine. Get around it. Oh, what about you, Mason? Yeah, I'm on the. Uh, oh, I've got to stop saying Matt LeBlanc because it is actually becoming a trending <laughs> nickname, the LeBlanc. Um, do you know, how was that good um, Sans Gria? Um, I was just about to say it on Instagram the other day. Oh, my God. Incredible. So good. So I can't think of the guy. I can't think of the guy. Oh, I'll have um, to, I'll have he's to a comedian him. and he does drink reviews and he's reviewing uh, Altina Sands Gria. Yeah. And he was like, love and life, double thumbs up. He, really, <laughs> yeah. he was really loving it, wasn't he? He that was. was nice he was. to see Altina get a little shout out. Yes. So, and they're so good to us and we love having them as our potty partner and they've given our listeners a discount code, which is... Yay. It is BFB10. And you can jump online at www.altinadrinks.com. Go nuts, shop up storm, and yeah, get yeah. some Altina down your neck. Yeah, get your 10% off. Go, go, go. Yo, <laughs> thanks, Altina. <laughs> we love you. Meso. Risa. We're up and about. Look at our little wiggle. We are massively up and about. We're <laughs> wiggling away in our little seats here. Yes. Um, well, you need to introduce a guest, Meso, because you oh, um... organised this whole potty. Bless your heart. Well, we've just had Lucy Quick on. Lucy is the um, founder, co-founder, but now the founder of Thrivalists, which is a sobriety space online. I'm going to just read to you where she's been. Where she's been seen. Okay, okay. Okay. She's been on. She said Triple M, ABC, Babyology, uh, Body and Soul, Daily Mail, Fox FM, Mamma Mia, Odie Who, Prevention, Sydney Herald Sun. Um, take five, the age, uh, morning show. There's been on the morning show, start company, and she said, I think there's more, and I hope that I, I know that she's just all a long list, though. So. It is a quite an amazing list. Lucy, um, yeah, she's four years sober, she's started Thrivalist, it's online, all the details are in the pod, but she's just isn't she a beautiful human being? What she's, she's doing, so Thrivalist mm. is a yeah, online space to help, um, females. Mm. Uh, yeah. manage their relationship with alcohol mm. and to, yeah, to give up booze essentially, isn't it? Yeah. And to educate them. The educate. education is massive. Yeah. This is her little This is her little thing that I love on her page. She says, it doesn't matter if it's your first or 30-second try at sobriety. I want you to know right now that the only fay when it comes to sobriety is to quit quitting. Boom. I love that. I love that. Every step you've taken on this journey has led you to this moment. It's what you do from now on that matters. If you're looking for support, community, powerful education that you'll never unlearn, learn how to love yourself and have fun along the way. The Sober Curious 28 Day Challenge is for you. But it's, she's got a membership. So get all up in the membership. Yeah, and it's got a, a membership. beautiful community. It's global. Get amongst it. We love this chat with you, Lucy. And thanks so much for joining us. Let's get amongst it, shall we, with Lucy? Let's go. Here she is. A big, warm, booze-free Bants with Buddies. Welcome to Lucy Quick. Welcome, Lucy, to the potty. Thanks, May. Sorry, thanks for having me, ladies. So excited. Yes. Well, you know how we roll. And we're going to throw you straight in the deep end. You've got a choice between confession session or shame story. Shame being a little bit darker and really shameful or confession <laughs> session being a bit silly and lighter. Your, your choice. Okay, let's go with shame. I honestly, this was the reason I stopped drinking, and it was my rock bottom moment, and it was Christmas Day 2018. 
And I started drinking at 10 o'clock in the morning um, and continued on throughout the day in front of my entire family and in, you know, in-laws, family, my sisters, friends, and a whole bunch of people I didn't know and just basically got blackout drunk, had a massive fight with my um, husband at the time and and decided to run off down the street barefoot, nothing on me apart from the dress I was wearing and my underwear, jump in. um, Actually, I must have had my phone. I did have my phone. Jumped in an Uber and went to a party that I wasn't invited to that I'd heard about. Um, Broke the, the front fence at this house and then ended up Someone put me in an Uber, thank God, got home, and the next morning a pop-up on my phone alerted me to the fact that I had been banned from Uber. So I had a notification saying, your account has been deactivated. Contact Uber for more information. So that was my rock bottom, oh, my God, Um, yeah, shame story. change. Well, okay, we need to unpack that a little bit more. (laughs) Tell us why you got your um, account banned from Uber. (laughs) Well, I actually don't know because I was in a black. Oh, oh so no. I still to this day, and I, I wrote about it in um, my mom, a Mamma Mia article, and it was funny because a couple of the comments underneath were like, "Let's find out what happened," and I'm like, "No, <laughs> let's never ever find out what happened in that Uber because I'm horrified." Um, yeah, oh. horrible moment in my life. We can so relate. Yeah, totally. Yep, relate. yep <laughs> totally. <laughs> How we even have Uber accounts, I'm not sure. But, yeah, God bless. Thank God you're still here to tell the story, though. Thanks for sharing, Lucy. Thank God. Thank you. Did, um, not, not sorry, even. I've got more questions. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Because I, I, I feel like I know how you felt the next day. Like what, what when you woke up, what, where was yeah. your head at? Well, my body was upstairs in the random spare room, which was weird. Um, I'd wet the bed, which was not so weird. Oh. And, um, yeah, I just was consumed with a deep sense of self-loathing and shame and regret. Um, and I think it was, you know, it wasn't the first time at all that I'd done this kind of stuff. Thing, and it had kind of happened my entire life as a drinker, but it was more the kind of bordering on breaking the law stuff because if you've been banned from Uber, you've obviously done something pretty bad. And, yeah, it was just a moment of I'm a mum, I've got a six-month-old baby sleeping downstairs, I've got a four-year-old daughter who needs me to set an example for her. What am I doing? What am I doing with my life? So I was in a shocking headspace and... I mean, that kind of carried on um, over that Christmas period up until my last drink, which was New Year's Eve 2018. So congratulations. Is it four years and four months sober now? Yeah. Well, end of March, it'll be, yeah, I've just done my my four-year, three months. So we're going, moving into the fourth month. I know. Congratulations. It's so That's so amazing. A Thank really you. incredible effort. You should be so proud of that. As we always say, if sobriety was easy, everyone would be doing it. So well done. Thanks so um, much. You have given us a little bit of insight, but yeah, how did we get here? Paint us a picture of what your drinking looked like, which you've already sort of touched on <laughs> and how bad it got in you know, how you got here and gave the flick. I want to know that 10 o'clock in the morning drinking, were you like, were you just punishing yourself? Were you escaping something, Lucy? Are you like trying to know? Yeah, I was. And to be honest, the 10 o'clock in the drinking was not an everyday thing at all. It was, that was a Christmas day. I'd actually had an argument with my ex-husband Christmas Eve and so it was kind of like, well, fuck it, I'm just going to write myself off today (laughs) kind of. Um, Yeah. And there was never much, yeah, I mean, there was never like a conscious decision, I'm going to get blackout drunk today. Um, Unfortunately, when we're stuck in that drinking cycle, we never consciously want to get to that place. We don't actually make that decision. But for me, I'd always been a blackout drinker since I started drinking when I was 14. And I was just one of these people that should never have drunk alcohol. It just did not agree with me. It was my kryptonite. It turned me into a completely different person. And I you know, recall being 14 and my friend saying to me, you're crazy when you drink, you shouldn't drink and thinking that's weird. Why am I the only one that's kind of passing out, falling over, wetting myself, um, doing things that I regret. But for me, alcohol gave me a sense of comfort. It made me feel like I'd come home to myself, which was quite sad. I had quite low self-esteem 
and low confidence. So it gave me this feeling of feeling okay. Mm -hmm. And I spent, you know, the 20 years that I drank trying to figure out how to drink normally, trying to figure out, trying to master being a normal drinker and how can I make, you know, how can I bring alcohol or have alcohol in my life without it being such a destructive part of my world, which it was, which obviously I never mastered. Um, and there were 20 years of, of, you know, really embarrassing stories, shameful stories. I mean, the Uber is one, there's a plethora of those, those shameful stories. Um, you know, fights with friends, cheating on boyfriends, you know, horrific fights with partners that were just so unnecessary, um, running off down the street, leaving, you know, friends, losing handbags, losing phones all the time, um, a really messy, just a messy, messy drunk. And, you know, because of the society that we live in, the world we live in, we don't, we don't question whether alcohol is a problem. We question like, why can't we drink like other people? And that's why I really tr tried so hard to get it right. Um, and then, you know, after, so, you know, I married someone who was also a big drinker. And so we came together and our relationship very much revolved around alcohol and he, we enabled each other. Yeah. I definitely don't blame him for kind of my spiraling into an even worse place, but he, gave me, allowed me to be crazy without pulling me up because if he gave me permission to be like that, then he could kind of drink how he wanted to drink. Um, <laughs> so then, like. <laughs> yeah, my drinking after our marriage, it got, it got worse, but I wasn't going out. So we got married and I spent a lot of um, the, the, the six years that we were married at home on weekends drinking alone because we were, towards the end, I mean, we'd often not even drink together. He'd drink inside on the couch and I'd sit outside and drink and chain smoke basically and pick up my phone and call anyone and everyone, anyone who would answer basically. Um, and it just got into this place of it being, okay, so it wasn't just the weekends and a few times during the week. It was every single night. I was working in a job that I hated. I had at that time, um, I had my first child and then, you know, you stop, you stop drinking when you're pregnant and then straight after my drinking returned to that kind of level pretty quickly, you know, after I stopped breastfeeding, obviously. Um, but it just got worse and worse and worse. And it was leading up to that 2018 Christmas. My son, I, I mentioned before, was, was six months old and I'd just been drinking again like I'd, you know, been drinking before getting pregnant. So I think he was about... Um, six, six to eight weeks old when I was forced to stop breastfeeding, he had a cow's milk protein allergy. So I couldn't breastfeed him, which gave me permission to get back into my drinking really quickly after he, after, you know, he was a baby, uh, when he was a baby. And, um, yeah, so he was six months old and, um, that Christmas day happened and, it was really that it was really that that rock bottom Christmas day of waking up and going, Oh shit, this is getting really bad. I've just been at this party full of people I don't even know, made a complete fool of myself. But it wasn't that night that that solidified my decision to get sober because there was one more drinking occasion after that. And it was a few days later and it was a friend's wedding. And I'd said to myself, We have to moderate because clearly if I you know, let go of the reins and have a few too many drinks, it's going to end up exactly how it ended up on Christmas Day. And I remember getting my makeup done for this wedding and I was still like so anxious and shaking and I was so consumed with this shame and guilt from Christmas Day and um, I was really nervous about the wedding. Like how am I going to drink? How am I going to be? Um, and so I wrote this mantra on the back of my hand on, on pen, actually, no, the inside of my hand so no one could see it. And, I'm, and I said, I will moderate my drinking today, no matter what. And <laughs> it was on my hand and I kept reading it. I'm like, I've got this, I can do this. And literally one glass of champagne and then, yeah, just complete debauchery. And I was at this wedding and I ended up, um, I ended up going back to a house party. My, my ex, my husband at the time left to go home to relieve the babysitter. And I said, I'm going to the house party. And even my friends at the house party said, you actually need to go 
went home. They put me in an Uber. I went home. I went inside. I got back into an Uber and went back to the house party that I'd just been told I needed to leave. <laughs> um, and at that point it was like my friends didn't know what to do with me. They had to, like, put me to sleep on the couch. And I woke up and just was like, this is it. Like, I've tried everything. I have tried absolutely everything for 20 years. I'm a fucking loser. I can't moderate. And, yeah, that was it. That was the last time I drank. And it was actually listening to a podcast that Ruby Warrington was on and she was talking about Sober Curious and the fact that you don't need to identify as an alcoholic and all of these years that I'd been saying to myself, well, I don't get up and drink in the morning. I'm not drinking, you know, vodka hidden in wardrobes and I'm not kind of drink driving to work in the morning or anything like that. I'm okay. But this whole concept of are you an alcoholic or not had really kept me trapped in my drinking for 15 years longer than it should have. If I had have heard about being sober curious and the fact that you don't need to be an, identify as an alcoholic to stop, I probably would have stopped when I was 16, 17, you know, maybe, yeah. who knows. So, yeah, that's that's my, my story. We, we often hear that too, Lucy, as people, um, they're like, oh, well, I'm not an alcoholic. Or even just in conversations that I have out and about, mm. people justify it how much they drink to me. I'm like, I don't, I actually don't care. Like you're, <laughs> you're, you do you, but it's funny how those conversations come up. Um, but tell us what's been some of the biggest lessons you've learned over the last four years and four months, three months since you stopped drinking. Well, I mean, the biggest thing is how emotionally immature I was up until I stopped drinking. And what happened when I stopped was, well, yeah, the first few months were tough. The first year was pretty tough, to be honest. And I had to get through a lot of cravings. I had to learn how to socialize sober without alcohol, which was, you know, really, really tough to begin with. But I guess the biggest lesson is all of the work that I hadn't been doing on myself to be a happy, content, um, successful person had just been put on pause while I was drinking. So I had to work through a lot of that as well, um, which has been incredible. It's just been, you know, the best part of sobriety is I often say like sobriety is just the tip of the iceberg and underneath is this huge, big, you know, amount of work that we have to do do without, you know, do on ourselves and learn about ourselves. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's a, so many lessons that I've, yeah, had to learn along the way. What about what about the lows, Lucy? Is there like you mentioned all the good the good parts? What have been yeah. some of the lows that have stood out to you? I often have this memory of early sobriety um, and the emotional triggers. So for me, alcohol I used alcohol to overcome emotional triggers mainly, and and to fit in socially. And when I started to feel these triggers in early sobriety and I didn't have my my comfort blanket of alcohol, it was really hard. And so I have, you know, there were probably three times where I was physically in pain and having to kind of nurse myself. I don't I know this quite, sounds quite dramatic, but I actually had to get into a ball on the ground and like hug myself and just sob. Mm. Um, which was a really painful experience. I felt really alone as well in early sobriety. I didn't have a community. I didn't have, I didn't know anyone that didn't drink. Yeah. I literally did not know anyone who didn't drink alcohol. Yeah. And my partner was still drinking, so I was around it, you know, constantly. Um, but, you know, again, I look back on those moments as now incredible, wonderful experiences. But at the time, really tough. And having to... Having to essentially navigate, um, well, I guess the veil is taken away from our eyes, right? So, for the first time in 20 years, I can see my life with crystal clear clarity and suddenly I realise all of these things that I have in my life are actually not meant to be here and they don't support me and it's not the life. The life that I was living was not the life that I wanted to be living, Um and so, one year into my sobriety, I realized that I needed to end my marriage. It was a really unhealthy, unhappy marriage. It had been for a very long time, unfortunately, pretty much the whole marriage. And so, coming to that realization was terrifying. 
it was during the first lockdown, that first 2020 Melbourne lockdown. And it was, um, yeah, it was terrifying. But as it turned out, just the best, you know, the best thing ever for, for me, for the kids, for him. And we're actually very amicably separated in a great place. Our kids are really happy yeah. and we've made it work really well. But, I mean, it's tough. Separation is is terrifying. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. It is traumatic. Mm. Some, sometimes it feels easier to stay in it than get out of it because it's safe and, you know, go, yeah. stepping out of that is, yeah. I, I love what you said about, um, and I'm sorry, I feel like such gut-wrenching pain when you were a ball on the ground and, and you know, nurturing, cuddling yourself. That is such really beautiful advice for our listeners as well. Mm. When you are in that pain and you are feeling all the feelings, you talk to yourself like little Lucy, like you, as you would your friend. Like if I was with you now, Lucy, and you were on the ground, what am I going to say to you? You bring that back and circle it back on yourself, don't you? Which I've done recently. I've talked to myself like, it's okay, little Claire Bear. Like, it's okay. I see you. Yeah. I feel you. I can see you're in pain. It's okay. You're going to get through it. And you really... It's such a beautiful tool, I think, to use when you're going through that tough stuff, I reckon, as well. Mm. So four years ago, though, and you did mention this and you wish that, and I was the same, I, I had a double in sobriety probably nearly 12 years ago now, but there was none of this sober curious movement. You were on your own. So no one was doing what you're doing with Thrivalist four years ago. So what tools did you use to keep you on track from the point of sobriety to creating Thrivalist? What tools were you using? Well, I guess I was lucky that there were there were some kind of books. I mean, it wasn't like there was nothing out there. I mentioned Ruby Warrington before. Her book, Sober Curious, was incredible. So the tools I used off the bat were reading as much as I could about sobriety and learning, like constantly researching, almost just obsessed with it. And yeah. we often see this at Thrivalist. Women will sign up and they become obsessed with understanding sobriety, understanding alcohol addiction and overcoming it. And then they get worried. They're like, I feel like I'm spending too much time kind of invested in this, but it's it's actually really important. And I'm sure, you know, part of Thrivalist is actually we recommend reading Annie Grace's This Naked Mind because that's all about rewiring our neural pathways and reprogramming pr programming our subconscious beliefs. So I did all of that. I read Annie Grace. I read all the books. Um I, I kind of adapted my own tools that worked for me. And the one that you just described then, the holding yourself in a ball, that is actually one of the tools in Thrivalist now. And we call it the holding space for yourself tool. So it's actually allowing yourself to sit in the pain and to allow the pain to flow through your body and not be afraid of it, knowing that it's not going to kill you, it's not going to hurt you. And every time you do that, you literally become a little bit stronger. So you really, you, you know, you're training that muscle inside of you to be able to adapt and, and, and deal with pain in a healthy way and move through it. Mm. Um, another tool was to play the tape through. And I mean, this is the most popular tool, I think, in the sobriety world. Um, do I need to describe that one? I feel like everyone knows it, but I'm happy to. So, if, yeah, 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 bring it. Yeah. Yep. So playing the tape through, and I think it's been adapted differently for different programs, but at Thrivalist we talk about really visualising if you do take that drink. So you have a craving and then think, okay, what's going to happen if I do take that drink? What's going to happen 30 minutes later, an hour later? And really playing it through every 30 minutes um, up until you go to bed and even what your sleep will be like and then how you'll tomorrow morning and then doing the same for if you decide to sit through the craving to, to use the tools um, to work through the craving. So there's a number of different tools that we use in Thrivalist as well, like the 3D. So delaying, so set a timer on your phone, um, say, okay, in 10 minutes time, if I still want to have a drink, I will allow myself to have that drink. So that's the first thing. And then distract so doing something that brings, you know, brings you joy, that boosts your dopamine, that makes you feel good, even if it's like do 50 burpees. I mean, that's too, probably too many. Um, <laughs> doing something to kind of shift the energy and, and to feel better um, and then decide and then look at the, t the clock when the timer goes off 10 minutes later and then make that call. Okay, I am going to have a drink or I'm not going to have a drink. And it's more than often. I mean, it's always a no because you've really made that conscious choice as opposed to just giving in to the craving. Um so, yeah, th they were some of the tools that I learnt and, and used. Um, for me, it was really about how to recreate my, my life that, so, so that it supported me in sobriety because my life as a drinker was no longer the type of life that I wanted to live. So, I, I literally had to take a look at all of the habits 
um, that I had created over, you know, the 20 years, which included, you know, a lot of takeaways, a lot of eating out, um, a lot of, you know, putting my kids to bed and then heading out with my friends. So, a lot that involved socialising around alcohol um, and and look at what kind of, I guess, identity I wanted to create in sobriety. And for me, it was, I want to be a really fit, healthy, confident, intelligent, ambitious woman. And to be that, I have to now create a whole bunch of habits that support that goal of, of being that version of me, um, which, you know, it's still a work in progress, but it's a lot of exercise. I'm a addicted to exercise, which I think is a great addiction. Nothing wrong with that. Um, I train heavily at the gym. That was a massive tool for me in sobriety, just getting into the gym and pushing myself to the past the point that I'd never pushed myself before. And I keep doing that and I'm getting fitter and stronger. Um, really taking a look at the food that I was eating from a place of nourishment. I spent a lot, a lot of time doing a lot of fad diet. So a lot of like fasting, uh, and, and, you know, no, no disregard to anyone who does that. But for me, it was more about how can I create a, a healthy, nourishing diet where I can eat like this for the rest of my life? I'm not having to constantly change the way that I eat. Um, and, yeah, so I guess it was, yeah, creating a lot of healthy habits to support to support myself in, in the new way that I wanted to live. Feel, and I that. feel like we've got that healthy best version of, mm. of yourself in front of us on oh, screen. It's like <laughs> <in progress. laughs> oh, it always it's is, isn't it? Yeah, you, it are, is. you are beaming health and empowerment. You're all power girl. Oh, Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so then tell us, Lucy, when Party Girl Lucy stops drinking, um, what were some of the re reactions that you had from family and friends once they found out? especially back four years ago because, again, like when I stopped drinking in June 2021, I was like, I'm the only person in Australia that's not drinking. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I was clearly wrong. But back four years ago, what, what were people saying? How were they – how did they handle it? Well, it was interesting because, I, I mean, it's not, not interesting now that I know what I know, but a lot of people questioned – the full-blown sobriety. They're like, well, hang on, surely you can just moderate. Even my parents who'd seen me that Christmas day and were like, oh, my God, my daughter is crazy. But even they were like, can't you just have a couple? Like, why do you have to stop drinking altogether? That was the general response from most people, even the one, I mean, everyone knew that I had, everyone knew that there was something that wasn't right with me when it came to alcohol. But sobriety was not the answer in their mind. Apart from my sister, and she actually was a very big part of me going sober. She actually said to me, "Have you ever thought about just not drinking alcohol?" And those were, and this was the, the in the lead up to me getting sober. And those words, when she said them, I burst into tears. It was like a dagger through my heart. I'm like, "What do you mean?" For me, that was failing, right? Because I'd tried to, you know, to control it for so long. Um, she was the only one that, when I stopped, she's like. Like, hell yeah, you know, that's 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 awesome. Everyone else was a bit like, can't you just try and figure this out? Um, and you know, as time went on, it was quite clear the people who also struggled with their own drinking because they were the ones that really questioned it. And um, you know, we 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 say that when we stop drinking, it's like holding a mirror up to everyone else. And you were just saying before, I think it was Mazo, um, you know, people always, when, when you say, when I say what I do, I'm a sobriety coach. The first thing they say is, oh, you know, well, I don't think I drink too much. I do, do, do. And I'm like, I don't care. Just because I coach women to help, you know, to stop drinking doesn't mean I look around at everyone else's drinking behaviors and judge others because I don't have time for that. Um, but yeah, people, people become really concerned about their own, own drinking behavior, behavior when we start to question our own. And that's just because of this role that alcohol plays in society. It's it's an important part of life. It always has been. Um, and people just can't wrap their head around the fact that it's actually a really yucky, horrible, toxic substance and we shouldn't really drink it. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. What about I, your hubby? Was, was your hubby, like, because obviously he was your drinking partner to a point. What was he, was he supportive over that year? Or well, he was just very much, you do you, don't tell me what to do. Yeah, okay. So, um, it made it, it made 
early sobriety tougher, but I actually felt, I mean, even more motivated. I'm like, I'm just going to, I'm going to really do this. Mm. And as soon as you start to feel, you know, obviously there's a lot of crap that you've got to get through in those early weeks and months, but then you start to feel, for me, I had the pink cloud. So I started to feel electric and euphoric and like, I had bought a whiteboard and I was like, I am going to change the world. I don't know how yet it's going to happen. Um, And that for me was like, holy shit, this is so worth it. I'm just going to keep leaning into this. And so, yeah, sorry, I segued then. But to answer your question, um, he he was not really supportive but not unsupportive. And I guess in a way, again, like, it would have made him feel quite insecure about his own drinking mm. because here I was like sober and by the time that we'd separated, I'd launched Thrivalist. So I was very well into that, into the, you know, the sobriety space as a business as well. So, mm. yeah. But what about then for um, like family and friends who have a loved one that uh, have decided to go sober? What advice would you give to those people um, in terms of their reactions and how, how to support somebody? So how to support a loved one if they tell you that they've stopped drinking. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think always, you know, crystal clear communication is really important between a relationship or, you know, or a friendship, any type of kind of, you know. Um, And it's all about asking how can I support you? What do you need? Because often when we stop drinking, we forget that other people aren't mind readers. So we have all of these needs and and we expect to be supported. And a lot of the ladies in Thrivalist will say, I can't believe my husband still drinks every night. You know, I'm doing everything in my power to to not drink. And yet he's cracking open a beer at five o'clock. And and it's like, yeah, but have you expressed to him what your needs are and what your expectations are and and what's going to really support you? So on the flip side, I think the if, if the partner can ask, how can I support you? Get really clear about that. So there's no gray area or confusion. Um, I think that sets you up for a really successful sobriety. And some people don't care with about alcohol being around them. Other people, it really triggers them. So everyone's really different. Mm. I love that. I actually had a friend um, who she would always, and she still does have alcohol-free beer in her fridge. So oh, I know gosh. if I pop in, I can have a beer with her. I just don't have booze mm. in mine. Love that's really that. Nice. That's so cute. That's so nice. And so, really- yeah. No, no, no. I was just going to say, um, it, you know, some people are triggered by alcohol-free beers as well. And so yeah. I've actually, I was talking to a client last week and she said, my girlfriend, she pulled out the alcohol-free wine for me. It was so sweet, but it made me burst into tears. It really triggered me and I nearly wanted to drink. You know what I mean? So, yes, that's great for your friend to do that because she knows that that's something that, was really supportive for you, but not everyone's the same. And this is where it becomes really difficult. And that's where communication is so important. Love that. Love that. I saw a quote the other day, just going on back, um, Breeze's initial question about that support and what pushback you had and with your family saying, or the only person that wasn't, was on your side was your sister. And then your family were saying, you know, can't you just moderate? And we always talk about it, how alcohol is the only drug that if you don't drink it, people think you've got a problem. If you don't drink yeah. it, and like we said, if it was a ba- you know plate of heroin, or are your family going to say, "Can't you just moderate your hairs up?" Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, I know. It's just ludicrous. Like it is just madness. But the, and that's how instilled alcohol is in our society, you know. And yeah. hopefully, with these conversations, it, it does normalise that it's okay to to give it the flick. So, Lucy, how do you feel about alcohol now? Well, I think that it's toxic, poisonous, carcinogenic substance that is completely unnecessary in our society and it's a waste of time. It's dangerous. I mean, all of the the data tells us it kills more people than all other drugs combined. So I am very anti-alcohol. In terms of how I feel about it when I'm around it, don't notice it, don't care completely, you know, I'll, I'll see someone who's drunk and go, oh, God, you know, have a laugh, whatever. It's It doesn't trigger me to see it. I never crave it. Um, it really is just a non-event for me. But I'm very, yeah, I'm really passionate about spreading this message around, like, what it actually is mm-hmm. um, and the fact that we are still, society is still brainwashed to believe that it's an important part of life and, and it's really not. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Yeah. 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 It's glamorized, cool. isn't it? Yeah. Mic drop. <laughs> Mic drop. <laughs> it is. It's glamorized and yeah. romanticized and it's all, it's all, we don't need it. And, you know, to live the most healthy, authentic, vibrant, incredible life, it doesn't need, you don't need alcohol. Alcohol is just going to slow you down. Yeah. yeah. Hand break. Boom. There's a quote of the app. Um, <laughs> you, you might have seen me, Lucy. I've been drinking um, Altina. Who I, I love podcast. Altina. Isn't oh, it great? Beautiful? Yeah. I so, love it. So gorgeous. Mm. Um, so how, how do you, do you use AF? So alcohol-free drinks or do you substitute what's – how do you feel about alcohol-free drinks? Yeah, look, the first thing I always say, and I think it's important as a coach to be really clear around the fact that alcohol-free is not for everyone. And when you venture out on your sober journey, getting really um, really clear with yourself around whether or not it's going to trigger you because often I've seen a number of women use alcohol-free to replace wine and it's ended up becoming a bit of a crutch in itself and then it very quickly leads back to wine so Um, everyone's different just being really mindful about and and you know yeah you'll know if it's if it's working for you and you'll know if you're using it as a habit replacement um now for me i love using alcohol or sorry i shouldn't say using it drinking alcohol free non-alc options from time to time special occasions it's definitely not a daily um thing i love altina it's one of my favorites i love etch etch i love because it's anything that's sort of healthy as well so it's going to give you that um those health benefits as well as refreshing and you know you can pour it in i love to pour it into a little champagne glass and pop some rosemary or pomegranate seeds in and and it becomes a bit of a you know a ritual or a moment um yeah so that's how and yeah it would be it's really sporadic just whenever i feel like it Really love that little shout out yeah. to Etch as well. Handy, I love Etch. And yeah. Handy yes. and Jace at Etch. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I was like, I was similar, probably Lucia. When I stopped drinking, I was really going hard on the alcohol free drinks. But now I just like I'll buy some if I am going out to somewhere. But um, I don't have as many alcohol free drinks. But I still use them as a tool. They're very mm. much still a tool to keep me off mm. booze. And it's interesting yeah. what you were saying too, Lucy, because I, I think when I first stepped into the alcohol-free space, I was a bit worried I would be triggered as well. And I did use them as I would use to numb. Mm-hmm. I was going through a breakup and a house move and pretty yucky stuff, you know, grief, and I was smashing them like I would be drinking wine. And I, I've been able to – I was aware what I was doing you know what I mean? And I, it's interesting to see that I was trying to find that little hit or that it's a little dopamine hit really, isn't it? Um, and I've been able to remove them. I've got a great relationship with them now and the same with you guys just on special occasions, et cetera. So, yeah, but interesting, isn't it? And that could have been a slippery slope, you know? Yeah, and it often I've seen it become a slippery slope for mm. a lot of people. Mm. You know, it's, it's all about learning our lessons, learning what works for us. We're all different and mm. always being, you know, being loving and kind to ourselves no matter what, even if we do slip back into it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that was an important message there as well for listeners I have who have just joined the podcast. I've had a couple of goes at sobriety over 10 years. So I knew that what that would have looked like playing the tape forward as you talk about it wasn't my first time I've dipped my toe back in. Um, Actually, have you, you haven't dipped your toe back in or been tempted in the, in the four years? No, I've accidentally had a cocktail because I was told it was alcohol free. It wasn't. Um, But it was fine. It was fine. Um, I haven't at all. I was so, I mean, it wasn't the first time I tried to stop. I had had one other serious attempt, which ended up about three months, and then I relapsed into, you know, even worse drinking. But, no, it was, yeah, the four, four years and four months have been very rock solid. Solid. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> well Thank done. You. So then talk talk to us about Thrivalist and talk to us about the membership, talk to us about the guest experts that you've had on, how did it start, what's involved, um, and what's your ultimate message that you want to get out to the listeners? Yeah, well, I mentioned before how when I got sober, there wasn't really, I couldn't find an empowering and supportive community that I felt part of. And I did go to AA for a few months. And whilst AA is amazing and it supported so many people, it wasn't for me, I didn't feel uplifted and energized and excited after an AA meeting. 
And so I always had this idea from that kind of point on of a few months into my sobriety to create a space for women to come together to get sober and support one another without any shame or any stigma because that was my experience. I was like, I don't feel ashamed of this. I'm proud of this. And there are so many women like me I know who are walking around stuck in this trap and I just want to give them that space to help free them. And so that's how Thrivalist started. It was also, I had an ex-business partner, Jen. So we met when we were training to become life coaches together and we partnered up and we pulled all of our, you know, learning and research and everything that we knew into a course, an eight-week signature sobriety course. And we launched it. It was July the 1st, 2020. So it's nearly three years. Um, And since then, so it was originally the eight-week signature sobriety course. Since then, it's grown into a membership platform. So inside the membership, so you sign up, you join the eight weeks initial sobriety course and you, um, yeah, you come into the membership, which includes over 12 group coaching and counselling calls a month run by myself. And there's three other coaches as well as a counsellor. And we have loads of content, um, like pre-recorded content with incredible experts and thought leaders in the sobriety space. So we've got William Porter, Ruby Warrington, Oh. Shanna Wan and experts oh. such as, um, yeah, and then all the experts. We've got nutritionists, dietitians, life coaches, menopause doctors. We have spiritual leaders and all sorts of, um, yeah, incredible experts. And something that we do at Thrivalist, which is a little bit different, is I'm really passionate about the amino acid supplementation programs to help women through early sobriety because when we stop drinking, our brain chemistry is completely depleted. So, we support the women alongside um, a specific naturopath who specialises in to um, self-diagnose any brain chemistry depletion and we then go on to, yes, um, prescribe specific. We don't need to prescribe. You can go to the chemist and buy it yourself amino acids to help to, yeah, improve brain chemistry. So a lot of women will come with a, a low dopamine level. Um, GABA is the same as well as serotonin. And so, yeah, so inside the, th- uh, the membership, there's also we have beautiful interviews with our members to support other members. We have um, accountability buddies. There's so much. <laughs> and is it global? So really, is it yeah. like global? Membership? It is global. Yep. So oh, we've got wow. women in the US, we've got women in the UK. And so once you've completed that eight-week course, which is really important, we don't, we really encourage that the women throw themselves into the learning and the education piece, not just joining the calls, not just being part of the community because it's a beautiful community. Um, There's lots of physical catch-ups as well. So we've got an event in Sorrento next week, actually. We have an event. I'm actually flying up to Newcastle to meet some of the members. So we do a lot of face-to-face stuff as well, but it's really important to do the educational piece as well. So learn because when we learn- it really helps to change our brain. I mean, it's the subconscious beliefs that we have around alcohol that mm. keep us stuck. Yeah. So yeah, that's it. Well, that's I don't think I don't it. think we actually even we don't really learn about booze. We learn, we get told drugs are bad, but we don't get told anything about booze. Mm. We don't get told that alcohol's a drug to start with. Correct, we get told correct. that it's different. Mm. Yeah. And it's okay. I mean, it's it's you know, it's normalized. It's just a normal part of turning 14. Okay, now you're gonna start drinking. So let's start. You know, let's drink at home first to make sure it's okay. I mean, mm. this is, as I said before, this drug kills more people than all other drugs combined, yeah. like all other drugs. And so why are we allowing, you know, this to happen with our teenagers? And we certainly wouldn't be doing this with other drugs like ice or heroin. Mm. No. Mm. Um, so just for our listeners, Lucy, so the eight-week um, course, can you start at any point? Like you just sign up and start? Yes. Yeah. So it's, it's, yeah, it's an evergreen course. So you can literally sign up and get started straight away and oh, come straight into the membership with, you know, we have calls on Wednesday, Saturday, it's Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, plus, um, yeah, all of the expert calls as well. So every month we'll have two different experts come in and take a live workshop. So you can actually be part of that. Oh. Um, and then you can go back and watch all of the pre-recorded content as well. And we'll put um, we'll put links in our show notes of how to sign up for that. Mm-hmm. Um, just another quick question: um, How old are your kids now, Lucy? Eight and four, about nine and five, actually. So, have you started educating? I suppose your nine-year-old 
around booze? Like, how do you go about that? She's a really innocent nine-year-old, touch wood for now, let's hope. Um, she's sort of yeah, not really aware of it. And it's funny because I've sort of said to her, you know, do you know what alcohol is? And she's like, oh, I think daddy has a beer every now and then. So I don't think I've needed to yet, but I will be the first <laughs> to be like, yeah, all over that from a pretty young age, I think. And just, you know, again, being really clear about what it is. I think yeah. that information that would have helped me so much as a 14-year-old. Yeah. Yeah, I really want to make sure she she has all of that knowledge and and my son as well. Yeah, yeah, education is key. Yeah. It really is. So then, within the Thriveless membership, do you see um, is there common questions that get asked, or is there common themes that pop up? Yeah, I mean, the most common question that I get asked is normally before women sign up to Thrivalist. And I actually had someone email me like 10 minutes before we jumped onto this call. The same question. It's, I've tried this so many times. How do I know that this time is going to be different? I don't believe that I can get sober. Mm. And this is honestly something I hear from, I reckon like five different women a week, Instagram or emails or Facebook. And I always have the same response. It's so important to not look at past failure. And I really don't like that word when it comes to sobriety. I think it's important to know that getting sober isn't about failing or succeeding. It's really a learning process. It's like learning to ride a bike. You just get better and better and better at it until it sticks. Mm. And so looking back at past failure, it's important to realize that all of the times you've tried, I mean, all of that knowledge has built up inside of you. Um, and, and it's also, it holds a lot of important information and feedback for us to take forward into the future. So it is always possible and all you really, really need is a deep desire to want to change. And if that's what you have, then I have 100% faith that, especially with Thrivalist, and I, you know, I don't want to sound too salesy, but with what I've created in terms of the holistic approach, yeah. um, it's 100% possible. It really is. So not yeah. worry, don't worry about past failure. It, it's actually irrelevant. Mm. Um to your future so just having that confidence that you can I know you can I, I yeah I truly believe that you can get sober I want to sign up <laughs> I know <don't, I'm> like, <laughs> well I want to be part of your community <laughs> well we have a um we've just launched a new program which is for women who have six months sober or have been in Thrivalist for six months oh yeah and it's Elevate and it's a program supporting women with like the what next. So, you know, you're sober and now what, next? what, what can I, how can I keep elevating and expanding and becoming the best version of myself in sobriety? So that's a beautiful oh. new container that's inside the membership as well. I love this, Lucy. What a beautiful that's space you've created. Gorgeous. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Do you have yeah. women? Uh, is it women and men, and males and females? Or? No, it's okay. So it's women or anyone who identifies as a woman or we've had a couple of, I don't, I, I don't want to say the wrong thing here, but a couple of gay guys because they get that the most important thing is that whoever signs up respects the feminine energy and what happens when kind of women get together, that, you know, that vibe that we get. Um, so yeah, it's a bit of a hard one these days to sort of say women only, but that's that's the type of space. I love that the feminine yeah. energy. That's gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah. And there's everyone in there. And there's I'm asking for myself here because I have <laughs> gone back to um, drinking occasionally. Um, oh, I didn't do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've I've been like if I have a night, like I've had pro in the last twelve months, I've had three nights out. Okay, and I have been mixing up alcohol drinks and non-alcoholic drinks like okay. I might have a wine then I'll have a non-alcoholic beer so um so I've like it's I, I'm very aware it's a slippery slope um but that's where I'm at at the moment and I'm quite comfortable with where I'm at people in your group are some of them still drinking or have some of them gone back to drinking or is it purely like sober that's our aim yeah so a few at the beginning will continue to drink for the first you know, a couple of weeks or a month while they find their feet. Um, some women like to kind of learn a little bit about it before stopping. Yeah. The women who have gone back to drinking, we, my, my ex-business partner, Jen, went back to drinking and that's kind of when Thrivalist, when, we, when, we, when I bought her out because, and no judgment at all to you, Brisa, yeah. at all. And I'm still learning about 
the fact that moderation, you know, can be possible. There are those unicorns out there. But for me, it's really important to continue to communicate, like, why? And that would be my question to you, actually, Breeza. Like, did it make your night more fun? Did it, you know, why? Yeah, I just I had one, I had a night out recently, which I'm we're going to talk about next week on the potty. But I literally I questioned it. I'm like, what am I doing this? And I'm like, I just want to loosen Larry night. That's all it was. I just like I just want to just get a bit silly. Yeah, <laughs> and so that's where I am really, really find it so important that we are silly and we're loose, but in other ways that don't involve alcohol and yeah. no judgment to you don't no, take that and I'm very honest like I'm very transparent with our with our um listeners here yeah um, but I did with, did get to um at a nightclub at one o'clock I stopped drinking and got on the whole free beers because I was like I'm at a good spot I don't need to drink anything more yeah so, so I was fully in control I was like yep I've had some nice drinks I'm going to go back to alcohol free drinks for the rest of the night yeah um, so I did and that I think- yeah, and I think, like, I guess it's my role, it's my job to protect because you could be, like, the one in 100 that can do this, right? Yeah. And it's my job to protect the 99 in 100 that think or want to do that because, let's face it, like, we all wanted to moderate. I really yeah. wanted to moderate for 20 years. Mm. <laughs> but it's my job to to protect the 99 in, in 100 and say, like, honestly, you don't need alcohol to do that. You could go out with Breezer and have an equally fun night and you don't need to drink alcohol to, to get to that space. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. 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 And I think that's really important that we always say to our listeners, don't pin your sobriety on mine or Breezer's just because Breezer's, you know, dabbling into moderating doesn't give you permission or the green light to go, oh, she can do it, I can do it. You've got it back to exactly what you said, Lucy, ask yourself why why yeah. you know if you're considering moderating why mm. you know, playing the tape forward it's really important that you stay in your own lane yeah totally yeah um, yeah and yeah. i guess with moderation it's important and this is a whole other conversation but it's important to have some really strict guidelines and once you start going past those guidelines a little bit even like a toe it's like okay no this is you know this is not working and it sounds like you're in that space of being very controlled still and yeah on but there's just every chance like there's so many opportunities to drink and so how do you as a moderator go well I'm going to drink for that one not going to drink for that one so that's where I find myself now I'm like it's easier to not drink it is yeah than it to is moderate because then you're going yeah. should I shouldn't I so that's sort of where I'm at now is like mm. there's a lot there's of head noise isn't there? yeah um, and there's just so many opportunities yeah. like there's literally every weekend every weekend and of course, it comes up to drink. Even if you're not drinking at home, someone will ask for a drink. Like it's just, just everywhere. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's busy. <laughs> it's funny because I don't. I guess I guess it's like you see. It's like that. You know, the RAS part of our brain. Like for me, I just see the opposite now. <laughs> My life is so not about alcohol. It's like. I'm constantly doing, you know, getting invited to do like Reiki healing sessions. And I went to a cacao he- healing dance ceremony oh, yeah. weekends ago. Like that's the world I'm in now. And, uh, yeah, I guess you kind of create that world. And maybe for you it's like I still want to be drinking a bit. But And you know what? Like, like I mentioned before, we all have to go down our own path. We have to figure this out on our own. No one can tell you what to do. No one can kind of, yeah, this is your, your, yeah, your life. That's it. Stay tuned, Good. peeps. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks, Lucy. Well, we're up to um, our little rapid fire where I'll just fire Ooh. a little, couple of fun oh, questions yeah. off, just, okay. a little bit, just a little bit random. So oh. you just went to Israel. Oh, my God. How amazing is Israel, by it the way? Is, have you been? Yeah, I have. Oh, incredible. it was the best holiday of my life. Unbelievable. Yeah, it's incredible. So, and Breeze has been to the Dead Sea. You've been to the Dead Sea. Oh. I've been to the Dead Sea. Oh, How amazing is that? Yeah. I that. Incredible. Let's talk about that crazy salty water. Was it was it mo- most stingy in your eyes, in any cuts or abrasions, or did it, your Regina Falange get more of a zing? <laughs> I am such a cautious person. I have, like, I'm a hypochondriac. So I thought that I could feel the sting before I even got into the water. <laughs> Um, so for me, it was like, I'm not allowing any part of my body that's not like, 
you know, I was very cautious. So I actually didn't feel a sting at all, to be completely honest. Oh, really? Honest. Right. But oh, I so loved, good. I didn't feel any sting. I loved doing, my p- partner and I were doing like sit-ups. We had like a full ab <laughs> workout going in the water. That was so, so cool. cool. It is so <laughs> amazing, amazing, isn't it? Oh, it really is. It is. I highly recommend the Dead Sea. That's so yeah. good. Um, you've got the two kiddos. So tell us, are they crust on or crust off kids? Crust on, on? Yeah. I'm like the most <laughs> basic mum. I don't have time to cut crusts I'm off. I'm the same, Lucy. I'm, I look at parents, I'm like, why are you cutting them off like the kid wants it? I'm like, just get, dish it out to them as it is. So what, around yeah. them. I'm so like that. No time. Ain't nobody got no time for cutting crusts off. <laughs> are, they, are they triangles or rectangles? Or squares. 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 <laughs> And the last question, and congratulations, you're um, with Bella Man- Modelling. Uh, so Bella Management, is that right, Bella Management? Yeah, Incredible. Curve Modelling. Curve Thank Modelling. You. Incredible. That's so amazing to be uh, with them. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, tell us then, what is something that the public need to know or surprised you most about modelling? Yeah. It's really fun. <laughs> you got a surprise? I don't know. It's so yeah. fun. It's like you go and you go to work, you earn really good money and you have like the best fun of your life and you come out home on a high. Oh, That's how I, I feel. Love that. It's really Sign good. Me up. Sign me yeah. up. <laughs> yeah. And also like that. the modelling industry is, you know, every a lot more people can be a model these days. It's not you don't have to fit this, you know, certain type of body frame and, and facial structure and skin colour anymore. It's like. Yeah, way more opportunities for models or people who want to be models. So go on, Mazzo. Yeah, yes, sign me up. Go yeah. for it. Because you're all about that. I love your your oh. yeah, your whole message around body image. It's so wonderful and thank important. You. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. It's been a, a wonderful little little side gig. Yeah. So thank phone, you. Fuck up with the PH. So we didn't give a F with the call or text. Phone, fuck up with the PH. I've just got like way too many. Like, I was thinking about this last night. I'm like, how do I narrow this down to one? And I think it's going to be my first ever proper phone fuck up, which was I was one of those geeks who was lined up out. out I lived in London at the time of the iPhone coming out. And I got up at three in the morning and I went down to the the phone, the O2, which was the phone provider in, in the UK and lined up outside the Apple store to get one of the first iPhones in the world. Oh, I was one of those committed, yeah, committed. committed. And I got my iPhone, and then that weekend I went to Barcelona. And during a blackout on my way home, walking through—I don't know if you've been to Barcelona, but they've yep. got like all the laneways um, off the what's that made the um, La Rambla. Uh, Rambla. Yep. And walking home on my own in a blackout with my iPhone, like trying to use it as a map or whatever. And I got mugged and someone stole it. Oh, oh my God, Lucy. <laughs> so I just remember being like, okay, now I've got to get my second iPhone and it's only been out for a week. <laughs> Were you okay? Like, I was fine. You got mugged? I was touch wood. I was totally fine. They just oh. took my iPhone. Oh, yeah. Um, they're ruthless in Barcelona, aren't they? they were and I mean, like, how unsafe to be walking home on your own. I know. And, yeah. We do it, don't we? But yeah. We completely lose all inhibitions, don't we? We think we're yep. so safe. Yeah. Oh, shame. Yeah. Shame. <laughs> well, and I'm lucky, then, really. Shattered yeah. for you. I'm totally <laughs> shattered. <laughs> oh, spewing. <laughs> Having to replace any phone but a new iPhone that you'd actually line yeah. up for. Oh, that Got hurts. A new yeah. yeah. And now we're on to recommendation of the week, Lucy. So tell us something that you want to recommend to our listeners. It doesn't have to be booze related. Anything that's what you joy this week. Yeah. It's time for the recommendation of the week. I have recently discovered the hydrofacial. I don't know if you've had a hydrofacial oh, before. Is that why you're so glowy and delicious? I, <laughs> I think it's more the, the beautiful ring light I've got. But <laughs> hydrofacial is... The most incredible facial I've ever had. It goes for half an hour and it's like a little tiny vacuum cleaner that pumps these amazing products, sucks, it sucks all of the the grime and stuff out of your skin, but then pumps all of these amazing products in and you're getting a massage at the same time. And oh, yeah, go and get a hydrofacial. Sign it's me the, up for that. Me up. I've never yes. heard of it. I've jotted, I've jotted it down. Hydrofacial. I need to sit Hydra out. facial. And you can Hydra. get them at like any kind of skin clinics, you know, the okay. ones that do a bit of the Botox and things like that. Yeah. So, oh, beautiful. Yeah. I love Great that. Great reco. Great reco. I love 
love this chat, oh. Lucy Week. Where are our listeners finding you? Tell yes. us. Yes. So the best place is my website, so thrivalistsobriety.com or Instagram at thrivalistsobriety. Amazing. Well done on what well, you've built, Lucy. Like, oh, thank you. Unbelievable. And you're helping so many others, which is what what it's what it's life's about, isn't it, helping others? Yep, service to others. And it's just, oh, oh I can't wait to see you grow even more. <laughs> and we will talk about everywhere you've been at the start of this podcast. But yeah. thank you so much for joining us, Lucy. We love everything you do. We love being part of it. Now you wear friends. Yep. <laughs> yes. But thank you, ladies. Yes. And yeah. thanks for your amazing podcast. It's so good. And all of my beautiful Thrivalist members love listening to you, ladies. So oh, thank you. Thank you. Today. Thank you. So that gorgeous. means the absolute world. So we look forward to seeing you in IRL again soon. Thanks, thanks ladies. Thanks so much for joining us, Lucy. Thanks, Lucy. Bye. 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 This podcast is proudly produced by our audio engineer, music extraordinaire, Eric Lab. We love you, Eric.